She's written two National Book Award finalists, Speak and Chains. That's her newest book. But she also writes wonderful picture books and has done a number of other books for teens. Please join me as I sit down with Lori Haltz Anderson. That's coming up next on Books Alive. Thanks so much for joining us today on Books Alive. It is my great pleasure and privilege as always, but this time it's really special. I have with me today in the studio the one and only Lori Haltz Anderson, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is really a treat. Now, you and I are sitting here, it's actually November. Yes, ma'am. And we're a couple of days away from you finding out if you have won the National Book Award for Chains. How does that feel? Honestly, um, at first it felt um, surreal because I, I didn't believe it. I honestly never thought I'd have another book nominated. It was such an honor the first time. Mm -hmm. I had to keep checking their website to make sure that no one had made a mistake. <laughs> and now, in all, uh, in all truth, I already have one because oh. just being nominated, I mean, it really, this is one of those cases where being nominated is beyond any honor an author could conceive of. Mm -hmm. So the rest is, you know, will be love. I guess it would be, uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, I, it's such an incredible um, concept. The, the respect that this brings the book for uh -huh. teachers and readers and parents, the visibility it gives the book, uh, makes me feel incredibly proud. This is a book that you love, and I know historical fiction is a real baby of yours. It is. It's a real passion for you. It is. And, I mean, I've read it. I have cried through it. I have, all, you know, just sat in wonder looking at it. Where did this come from for you? Well, I am a proud and patriotic American. Uh, my family's been here. My mother's people came over on the Mayflower. Wow. And we have uh, other relatives showed up in succeeding waves of immigration, usually either fleeing from the law <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or traveling to America in search of religious freedom, huh. which is uh, something that I, I adore about this country. And so I've always been incredibly proud of that heritage, and, and I adore the Founding Fathers. Mm -hmm. The Founding Father I love the most is Benjamin Franklin. Mm. I would have dated Benjamin Franklin oh, in high school. Cool. I mean, if he'd been the right age. Yes, yes. Um, he was intelligent. Uh, he was curious. He ran away from home when he was 17, mm -hmm. and he was a flirt. So that met all of my <laughs> specifications for boyfriends. Um, and he was such an incredible man. And when I was researching Fever 1793, mm -hmm. I came across a Benjamin Franklin fact that I hadn't known. And that is that Benjamin Franklin, in addition to everything else, mm -hmm. was a slave owner mm. from 1735 to 1781. Wow. And we have primary source evidence that mm -hmm. he owned at least seven people. Mm. And this hurt. Mm. It rocked my world. Mm -hmm. it, it shook my frame of what I thought I understood about our revolutionary heroes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I just tucked it away. I, I had other projects. Mm -hmm. When I was working on Independent Dames, a picture book about women and girls during the American Revolution, I, realized I had more um, information coming up about slavery during that time period. And I talked to my editor, Kevin Lewis, and I said, I have to write about this. Mm -hmm. And then that was a 2002, so that was six years ago. Mm -hmm. And I set off on a journey of research uh, that changed me as an American. Wow. Uh, it's been a, a remarkable experience. Well, this is Isabel. She's 13 years Isabel. old. And well, as I read this, I thought about our 13-year-olds today right. and them walking in her shoes and experiencing the choices she has to make, the risks that she chooses to take. Right. And, I, and I wondered at what they would think of it. Now, it hasn't been out. It's what? been out two weeks. Are you hearing half? from kids yet? I, ha I have heard from kids. So, okay. uh, you know, the early readers those, and, the, and yeah. the children of librarians and teachers ah. 
who uh, got the early copies. And, and uniformly, what kids have told me thus far is that they didn't know that this, the histo historical facts in the book. Mm -hmm. um, they got very caught up in the character, and they cried. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, you don't want to make people cry, but it's always oh. a sign that I've done my job. You you reach so deep inside yeah. with this one. You really Thank do. Thank you. And I felt as though the fact that, I mean, you've got the two sisters. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to set up the story, I don't mean to tell your story for you. Well, Isabel, um, as the book opens, um, her mother died the year previous, and the woman who owns them outside Providence, Rhode, Newport, Rhode Island, dies. Isabel has a younger sister who's five, and she, Isabel believes that the two of them were supposed to be freed in the woman's will. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is sort of poo-pooed by the nephew who inherits the property, and, and she and her sister are quickly sold to the Locktons, mm -hmm. who are a loyalist couple who live in New York City. Mm -hmm. And before she knows it, knows it, she's in New York City, and it's the summer of 1776, and the army's in town, and life is about to get very complicated. I was really struck by the concept of slavery in the North, yeah. which we never learned about as children. Right. And also, I found myself wondering, if I had been a slave then, what would it have felt like when everybody around me was talking about freedom and liberty, oh. only they weren't talking about me? Yes. Yeah, that was incredible. Just incredible. Well, I just, you know, the... the well, I, I don't know if I can forgive you for the fact that it doesn't end here. I mean, when I got to the, like, the last page, I was like... Oh, four. <laughs> <laughs> there will actually be two more books. Okay. It's a long war, <laughs> and it's a complicated topic. I, th when I started the book, um, my editor was wanting me to think about doing three books, and I said, well, let me f do one first. Right. And then when I got to the end of the writing process, I was just so in love with these characters uh -huh. and could hear them so clearly, I said yes. Yeah. So the second book, Forge, um, will be narrated by Corzon, mm -hmm. who is the friend of Isabel's mm -hmm. throughout this book. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll take us through the winter at Valley Forge, mm. which is a fascinating time. Wow. And then the third book, Ashes, um, I'm not quite sure about the narrator yet. I might do multiple narrators, which I haven't done in mm -hmm. a novel yet. And that looks at the Southern Campaign, the war in the Carolinas, and up to the Battle of Yorktown. Wow. Because Boy. the way we end the revolution sets the country up for the Civil War. Mm, oh, my. Right. You do some amazing research. If they would just pay me for the research, I'd never yeah, write yeah. the books. <laughs> <laughs> I love research. It's so much fun. Oh, that's great. I can great. never get enough of it. That's great. Well, I, you know, as I read this, I felt for Isabel because she's not only a slave, which is enough. Right. But the lock, that Madame Lockton, she's not a nice person. It's like sh this girl is trapped in two traps. She's like trapped in the trap of this evil, vindictive woman who owns her. And just the whole concept of slavery in general. So I thought, you know, any, any teen reading this can react to that sense of, you know, this person isn't being fair with me, you know, as, a, you know, as an adult or something like that. Oh, absolutely. Um, and the concept of adolescence that we have today is a very, it's a modern construct. You know, that we don't, haven't had the luxury of adolescence in our culture until really the past two or three generations. Uh, back in the day, when, when kids were big enough to pick up buckets of water, they were carrying buckets of water. Mm. Um, so that transition, uh, we, that you didn't have this gentle time, although it comes with its own baggage now with middle school, high school, and college. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm very interested. I've had very good experience with, um, with teen and uh, middle grade readers with my historical fiction. And I think what draws them to that is that they know life is hard. Even if they're living in privileged circumstances, mm -hmm. they know because their eyes are open, they're mm -hmm. looking at the world, mm -hmm. that life sometimes, before, without realizing what's happening, boom, you have an epidemic. Boom, there's war on your doorstep. Uh, and there's something within the nature of all children that wants to be prepared for that. Ah. And I think when they read historical fiction, it allows them to imagine, you know, what would I do if, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a way of in kind of ensuring mm. their own safety. Wow. That's a great insight. I've never heard that before. Now, I've read that you have a playlist. I do. That you could say, you know, this is the playlist for Chains. Right. What are a couple of songs that would be on that playlist? Mozart. 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 Yeah, okay. Mozart's absolutely. I'm putting together the playlist for Forge, the songs that I'm listening to, and they're much more kind of the, the military songs, the fife and drums, uh -huh. but it was Mozart for Chains. Oh, that's, that's great. D minor. 
Now, and you, you know, you and I were talking before about you and revision. Oh, yes. And how you don't usually like what you first write, but you love your revision. I am the queen of revision. <laughs> <laughs> I would rather get root canal than write a first draft. Because, and I know why kids say they don't like writing. Uh -huh. I completely identify with that. And when children say, oh, I hate to write, what they're saying is they don't like the way writing a first draft makes them feel. Hmm. I feel the same way. Because when I'm writing a first draft, it never comes out fluid and polished the way anyone's published book is. Mm -hmm. It's awkward mm -hmm. and vague mm -hmm. and overblown. Mm -hmm. And so you get those little voices in your head going, you stink. <laughs> You're a bad writer. <laughs> and that's a very uncomfortable feeling. <laughs> yeah. That's what kids are talking about when they say they don't ah, like writing. Okay. And I think the trick is for all of the adults in the village that we care for our mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. is to help them understand that's very common. Everybody goes through that. Yes. And if you can just get to revision, you take that first draft that's not so good, mm -hmm. but then you make it better. Oh, cool. And you experience these feelings of success. Yes. It's like, yes, yes, I just nailed that paragraph. Yes. Yes. So I love revision. See, I think what separates you from the rest of us is you can go and do that revision. The rest of us perhaps don't have quite the knack for revision that you do the queen of revision. Well, here. you know, there was a, when I started out writing, I didn't revise. Um, because I didn't pay attention in English class because I was a knucklehead. And I really honestly thought deeply within my heart as a, somebody in her mid-late 20s that uh -huh. if I had the talent, if I had the goods, yeah. that what came out of my fingers in the first draft uh -huh. would be good enough to be published. Oh. That earned me about 400 rejection letters. Wow. Literally? Literally. Oh, Whoa. honey, I have them in the file. Whoa. Oh, painful lesson. Oh, my gosh. No one's ever accused me of getting things the first time. You know what I mean? <laughs> And then, finally, after about 400, I was like, wow, this is not working. Yeah. And I stepped back and studied some craft um, ah. and analyzed books, yeah. you know, tore apart books that I thought were very well written, Ooh. and read a lot of author biographies. Mm -hmm. I didn't take any creative writing courses. Mm -hmm. And it was reading author biographies when I found out that, oh, you know, Joyce Carol Oates revises her work, and Stephen King, uh -huh. and oh, Charles Dickens. Ah. And if it's good enough for those folks, I thought, um, yeah, maybe I could get worth it a, a try. try. Oh, what it, a difference! I read spell check wasn't working, and <laughs> spell check is the devil. <laughs> <Yeah>. No. <laughs> All right, continuing with the historical fiction, we have the wonderful Fever, seventeen ninety three, and uh, Maddie. Maddie. And she has such great plans for that coffee house at the beginning of the book, and then life steps in. Oh uh, yes, it, as it does. Can you give us just give our audience a quick? sense of what this one is about. Maddie Cook um, is alive in Philadelphia in the year 1793. That was the year that George Washington was president. Thomas Jefferson was Secretary of State and being a pain in Washington's neck. <laughs> Philadelphia was the capital. It was the biggest city. It was the hip, cool city to live in. Washington, huh. D.C. was still a swamp. Mm -hmm. Although some people would say that really hasn't changed. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Political commentary aside. <laughs> and Maddie is a teenager growing up in that post revolutionary generation. And that's what interested me the early mm. days of America. And what did, it, what was the social conditions like? Mm -hmm. um, and then what happened that summer in the middle of July, a ship came up. They didn't know the direct cause and re uh, effect, but now we, we speculate that a ship came up from the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. People on the ship were infected with yellow fever. Wow. Um, it was a hot and muggy summer mm -hmm. in uh, Philadelphia. And the ship, where the ship docked, uh, that street very close to it is where you first had the fatalities. Mosquitoes would oh. bite the sick and go and bite the healthy, mm -hmm. and people started to die of yellow fever, mm. which is not a pretty way to die. Mm -hmm. um, and the epidemic uh, quickly gathered steam. Um, most of anybody who could leave the city, including the members of Congress in Washington and a lot of the wealthy people, did leave. Um, and it was a w an incredible world there for about two months when people weren't sure if anybody would survive. Mm. Some folks thought that the epidemic was sent by God to punish Philadelphia mm. because there had been a troop of actors that came to the town earlier that year. Oh, wow. And some of the Quakers thought, see, this is God's wrath because oh. you let the theater open. <laughs> but people were writing. There was a, a carpenter who wrote in his accounting book. He stayed in town. He mm -hmm. had to make all these coffins. And he sent his wife and children out, and he wrote a prayer in his, in his account book saying, Dear God, whatever it is we've done, Please forgive us. Oh my. Don't kill everybody. Oh, gee. So terrifying times. Yes. Terrifying times. Yes. So I take my character, Maddie Cook, 
who is a little bit like I was, you know, in my early teens, mm -hmm. um, kind of lazy, <laughs> prone to back talk, mm -hmm. um, disrespecting of her mother, you know, <laughs> every, every fine quality a young uh -huh. adolescent girl has, uh -huh. and I throw her in the middle of this whirlwind, mm. and uh, then, then people die. Mm -hmm. The Free Africa Society, yes. that was a revelation. It was to me, too. I mean, I, I, I think that sort of I mean, my, the path of my life has, you know, taken me to learning and studying um, the African-American history, which mm -hmm. is really such a significant portion of American history. Mm -hmm. We should all be studying it. It would be nice if we didn't just have a month for African-American History Month. Right. It's, you know, how about a 12 American months? Because we all need to study all of this. Yes. In order to, you know, respect uh, mm -hmm. each other and move forward as Get a nation. Get the complexity Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Yeah. The Free African Society was formed by Reverend Absalom Jones and Reverend Richard Allen. Mm -hmm. Both of these gentlemen had been born slaves and had obtained their freedom by their adulthood. One was a Methodist minister, one was an Episcopalian minister. Um, both of their churches uh, were disrespectful to people of color. Hmm. And so these men went out and together formed the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME wow. Church. Okay. And the, the, the mother church, Mother Bethel Church, was the first uh, church of that denomination in Philadelphia. You had in Philadelphia in 1793 the largest free um, black population in the country, hmm. although slavery was still legal many, many places, mm -hmm. uh, including in the north. It was illegal in, in New York State, I think, until 1827. Wow. But free blacks were coming to Philadelphia um, for work, um, to have homes, to join the church society, mm -hmm. and the Free African Society helped people get their new lives started. Mm. When the epidemic started, the doctors went to Reverend Jones and Allen and said, we need your help. Mm -hmm because we're pretty sure that people of African descent can't get yellow fever. Hmm. Got to remember there weren't hospitals back then, so people were getting sick and dying in their homes. Mm. Members of the Free African Society went door to door, made sure people had water and food, that they were buried properly, mm. that their children went to orphanages. And I think for me the critical moment in the epidemic is when the members of the Free African Society started to get sick and die. Because oh, right. the doctors were wrong. Yes, it's like chickenpox. If you're exposed sure. to the disease, if you were a slave in the Caribbean or mm -hmm. the Carolinas and mm -hmm. you were exposed to it, got a mild case as a child, then as an adult you're fine. Right. But many of these people had been raised in the north, oh. and they fell sick and died at the same rate, rate as Europeans mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. And yet, even knowing that, mm -hmm. the members of the Free African Society continued to go door to door to help the what sick. What courage! because that was the right thing to do. That's amazing. Incredible wow. story. Now, you told me a quick story before we went on camera about the school yeah. where the kids were doing the cross yes. curriculum fever thing. Yes. Can you talk about the boys? I tell you, <laughs> the teachers of America have done such an incredible job with this book. Uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's in curriculum all over the country. And I've been privileged to visit many schools where it's taught. Mm. And in uh, several middle schools, I I've, I've, have had days where it's a cross-curricular unit, and they study um, epidemiology academics and science, mm -hmm. they study the exchange of currency in math, mm. the cafeteria that day mm -hmm. serves a colonial menu like wow. with chicken pot pie and cornbread oh, cool. and apple brown betty. Yeah. And, um, and the one school I was talking about, it was a middle school in Reading, Pennsylvania, uh -huh. and they had these uh, group of five very energetic young men, mm -hmm. seventh grade boys, mm -hmm. one of them had a great voice. And so this school had a television program, you know, that they would tape in school. Uh -huh. And they had the boys made mosquito costumes, complete with the long nose <laughs> and wings, uh -huh. and they were just so into it. It was uh -huh. so so great. <laughs> and then they taped them, you know, doing the song "Give Me Fever." <laughs> In the you know just on and on and on and it was just like it was so awesome. Oh, that's so it was wonderful. interesting. Oh, and um, and the kids often in these will get special T-shirts. Uh huh. And it was very neat. In one middle school, I was I was visiting, and seventh graders are walking around with their fever T-shirts, and the eighth graders were all pouting, saying, well, "Why why didn't we get T-shirts?" Oh, you know. So whoa. All about a book. Upstage them. All yes. about a book. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Now you've got two historical fiction picture books. Yes, ma'am. One of them is brand new, yes, right? Independent yes, Dames. Yes. Let's I guess let's take a look at Thank You Sarah. My girl Sarah Hale. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a feisty dame. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, tell America what she did. Sarah Josepha Hale is a daughter of a Revolutionary War veteran uh -huh. from New Hampshire. And she was raised very excited about this country. Um, an intelligent woman who was educated by her brother who went off to college and then would come home and share his lessons with her. 
Um, and, and she was just one of those really energetic, smart women who in that time period didn't have a lot of outlets. She married a lawyer, um, and they had, they had lots of friends. They would get together and, and, and read books. They would have book clubs. Wow. Uh, her husband died when she was pregnant with their fifth child. Oh, gee. And um, she was given the option of becoming a mil milliner mm -hmm. to make hats, yeah. and she made hats badly. Oh, <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> what huh? Sarah could do is that Sarah could write. Mm. And she wrote a novel called Northwoods that mm -hmm. was published, and she became the, ladies, the editor of Ladies Goaties magazine. Wow. And became an opinion maker. It's so really the first first mass media for women in, in America, mm. an opinion maker for years, decades. Mm. And she would write a column every month in her magazine, mm -hmm. sort of like an early Martha Stewart, but with uh -huh. a real sharp intellectual edge to it, um, in, addition, <laughs> in addition to fashion and, and, and cooking and things. Mm -hmm. But she would, in her editorials, tell women, in her opinion, how they should be educating their children, what they should be doing for their country. Mm -hmm. And she took what had been a New England regional holiday, because Thanksgiving wasn't celebrated everywhere. And even in New England, it was celebrated whenever the harvest came in. That could change from year to year. Mm -hmm. And she realized that if we could have one national day of Thanksgiving, that would unite us. She Brilliant. spent 40 years writing to, having her readers write and wow. encouraging um, congressmen and governors and presidents mm -hmm. to make this happen. This is at a time that women didn't have the vote. Wow. And slowly... Uh, momentum built, mm -hmm. and and sl and she would she kind of made the holiday in some ways by describing it in her magazine, telling people what to cook, oh, giving wow. um, what you know their yeah. version back then of the Pilgrims landing. She although created it. She did. Wow. Um, what was interesting is that just as all the governors in America were getting on board, uh -huh. the Civil War broke out. Oh. And all the governors in the South pulled out. Oh. They didn't want to be party to a united effort. What a frustration. I know. <laughs> but she didn't give up. This girl, uh -huh. Sarah, never gave uh -huh. up power of the pen Whoa. in her hands. Yeah. And shortly after the Battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln signed the order that made Thanksgiving a national holiday. Wow. And it was completely due to her. Wow. That, talk about a visionary. Oh, golly, yeah. That's so cool. Yep. All right, now she's got some sisters she here. She does. Maybe they're In, aunts. They're a little uh, bit older. Okay. <laughs> Independent dames. Independent dames. You had fun here. I did. I call this herstory. Herstory. Yes. Can you just show um, who I dedicated the book to? Sure. I don't even know if you looked at that, but it was kind of Oops. kind of critical to understanding my motivation for writing was the book. Was it your grim? Yes. These are all the women oh, that yes. I've been able to find in my family right here. who were alive during the Revolutionary War. I did read those names yeah. and wonder, because it said my Revolutionary Grandmothers, and there was one, Holcomb, Holcomb. and I thought that was a family name. That is a family name. Yeah. These, yeah, these, are, the, these are the women who wow. came before me. And it's so nice to be able to put their names down, yes. because too often women's names are lost in history. Yes. Yes. And I, I wanted to understand, we, when I was a child, it's changing now, but as a child you're just taught this battle, this battle, this date. Right. And here's the Founding Fathers. Right. And it's so much more complex than that. Yes. I mean, those are important things to know. That's a seven-year war, and you have all the years leading up to it um, where the country's unrest. And mm -hmm. if it weren't for the support and participation of the women mm -hmm. um, in terms of boycotting and actively working to, for the war, the war would not have uh, been won, mm -hmm. which is not at all to downplay the role of the men uh, and the incredible sacrifices that they made. Right. But I think it's time for us to honor the men and the women. Right, integrated all. Absolutely, yeah. who made it, that it's happen. It's such a wonderful, powerful book, and it's so great to go back and read the actual examples of the individual women and and be able to say okay that's her name that's who she was right. and this is what she chose to do right and you know that's me you know I'm an American that's woman right so those are my roots that's really great you've done a number of picture books yes, and that are not really historical fiction nope. This one in Dito runs is this your first book this was my first oh! book published in 1996 cool yes. and you know it's set in Kenya yes where, where, where was your mind going that you did this one first? I'm a runner, and I was listening ah. to a radio show, and I was listening to a reporter who had gone to Kenya to go to the villages where the finest marathon runners in the world come from. Wow. And explore what is it in their lifestyle that, that helps prepare them yes. for, for their lives as athletes. And okay. It was, so that's where the book came from. It's just delightful, and you get such a sense of her freedom as she mm -hmm. runs. It's really great. Um, you've got a character, yes. Miss Charity Chatfield. Charity Chatfield. Yes, love the name. Could be a little little uh, series like Junie B. Jones right. or something. Right, right. No time for Mother's Day. You also did 
the wondrous turkey, turkey pox. pox. Yes. Yes. And then my favorite, I have to tell you, and I did not know this one, and I know you told me these are out of print. Yeah, Big Cheese is out of print. Big Cheese or Third Street. This is Philly, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is Philly. Yeah. Are you a Philly girl? Well, I lived there for almost 20 years. Oh. So it's my adopted hometown. Okay. I adore Philadelphia. That explains that. All right, so just so that our, our listeners who have younger kids know, you can start your kids off with Lori Hulse Anderson with the picture books. Then you move up to, you told me these are now volunt vet, vet volunteers. Vet volunteers. Right. Okay, and vet, it's, go ahead. The vet volunteers are uh, basically Babysitter's Club meets Animal ER. Oh, neat. You know, so yeah. kids will get to really get their hands into working with animals and exploring that connection between children and animals. And you've got great detail in here of being a vet, and, you know, and all the little processes and procedures and things of actually doing medical stuff with animals. Well, the veterinarians uh, of America were very good to me oh. and let me sit in their office and, oh. and pester them with questions and watch as they were doing procedures. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Well, I used to work in a bookstore, I was mm -hmm. telling you before, and when these came out as Wild at Heart right. back then, back in the day. they were... They just flew off the shelves. Nice. The girls just loved them. Lovely. So this is a chance you guys can come back. I would say your eight, nines, mm -hmm. and tens would, mm -hmm. would just really thoroughly enjoy these. So we're going to take a short break right now. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about the incomparable book, Speak. Stay with us. Underneath everything we are, underneath everything we do, we are all people, connected, interdependent, united. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united. I present to you Algebra 2. Biology. Who among you will step up to their challenge? Me. Yeah, do me too. I'm me. Take on the tough classes now. You need them to prepare for college. And welcome back to Books Alive. Um, Lori Hoss Anderson and I are about to pick up her absolutely incomparable book, Speak. And I know a lot of kids in Howard County, when they get into high school, they read this as part of their curriculum. Um, but I also know that this book has met with some censorship. Oh, absolutely, yeah. How has that been? Well, it's, it's never, you know, nice for an author when their book is censored. This is America, and we do have freedom of thought, expression, and intellect, and that's a good thing. Yes. I think it's hardest on um, the professionals, the teachers and the librarians, mm -hmm. who you know, who would never choose a book to harm a child, um, but who choose a book after a lot of deliberation because of what it can offer uh, their students. Mm -hmm. uh, what seems to have happened in most cases is that there are websites um, from extremist groups that just pull out sentences from books oh. that will have um, either bad language or a description uh -huh. of something that's a little disturbing. Mm -hmm. And they just pull out those one, that one sentence, they'll post it to the internet and encourage the people who support that group to try to get the book removed from the mm -hmm. classroom shelves. Mm -hmm. And most re thinking people would recognize that you could do that with pretty much any book on the planet oh, wow. and find one <laughs> sentence out of context uh -huh. that is uh, going to you know, raise some eyebrows. Right. What's been interesting is that in all, more than 90% of the challenges that Speak has faced, uh, schools often will have a committee uh, of adults who has to read the book, including the parent who's mm -hmm. bringing the concern or the community member who's bringing the concern. And they have to read the entire book. Ah. And in more than 90% of the cases, when, mm -hmm. the, when the parent, the concerned parent, I mean, I, I want to respect their concern because I think that comes from a legitimate place. Mm -hmm. When they read the entire book, they go to the committee and they say, I apologize. Oh. We need this book. Wow. Because this is a book about consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, the, it's consequences that we want all of our children to understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you're going to talk about consequences of bad behavior, you have to talk about the bad behavior mm -hmm. and do it in a way that doesn't glorify the behavior, but an accurate and responsible telling. Lori, for people who haven't read it, 
Can you just set the scene for them? Yeah, absolutely. Speak is really a book about depression. Um, in, the, in the book, the book opens up after the incident. The incident is a ninth grade girl is raped um, at a party by a senior in the high school. And for a lot of reasons, uh, she doesn't tell anybody. And it's that not telling that's the focus of the book. Uh, when you have something painful like that inside you and you don't tell, it just eats away at you and she spirals down into depression. And the book is really her journey finding the courage to speak up and go to somebody um, and share what happened and get the support that she needs. Mm -hmm. you, you really captured high school, the culture, the different kinds of kids, Heather mm -hmm. and her Marthas. Yes. I mean, you know, but you know what's interesting? I was telling my husband about this. You know, we've had two kids. They're 25 and 30. And I was describing to him what's in the plot. And he said, do kids want to read about that? <laughs> I said, oh, my gosh. I said, yes. And what have you heard in response from the readers? You know, because I would think you are just touching a chord with them. The response to this book has changed my life forever. Wow. It really has. I've heard, obviously, from thousands and thousands of sexual assault survivors. Mm. Um, all, all teens? Oh, no. I've heard from women in their 60s and 70s okay. who said that happened to me uh, when I was one woman whose letter in particular is um, standing out. That happened to me when I was 12, and my family was so ashamed of me, mm -hmm. they married me off to the next traveling salesman who came oh, through town. So, and she was just writing to tell me that things, you know, that that happened back then and those feelings were accurate back then and mm. it's just something that we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. So thousands of sexual assault survivors, male and female, mm. have written to me. Mm -hmm. um, what is equally as, as, as powerful is listening to boys who, and writing, corresponding with boys who have raped girls. Mm. Because um, most date rapes, um, you know, it's not the bad guy in the bushes with a gun. Mm -hmm. It's a nice boy. Mm -hmm. It's a boy whom I would let date my daughters. Wow. But under the influence of alcohol and or drugs mm -hmm. and with a high testosterone level and we're living in a hypersexualized culture, mm -hmm. boys will um, rape girls. And it's often not until they read the book that they understand why that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And we have to really pay attention to this. I've, I can't remember how many boys I've talked to, but it came across, um, for a while there I was going around the country talking about the book, mm -hmm. and I talked to every demographic, almost in every state, mm -hmm. and so many boys said, I didn't understand why she was upset. Mm. And that, that question comes from a very honest place, mm -hmm. because like I said, they're living um, surrounded by sexual behavior um, mm -hmm. on the television and the internet, mm -hmm. movie theaters, and not enough boys have strong male figures in their lives to explain to them the rules of human dignity. This is why we don't hurt women. This is how we treat women. If you tell a boy what the rules are, there's a very good chance he's going to follow the rules. All he needs is a little bit of guidance. So that's been life-changing. And the, the third letter that I commonly get um, are, are kids for whom the book is a window. YA books are either mirrors or windows. It's either a mirror into the reader's own life um, and responses and it helps them understand where they are and hopefully helps them on the next step to maturity, or it's a window that they can open into the life of somebody else that will allow them to develop empathy for another person. And I love the letters I get that start out, Dear Lori Hall Sanderson, I wasn't raped and I love my family and my family loves me, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really, really, really identify with your character. And I didn't, you know, I understood her feelings of depression and now, you know, they'll say, that girl who always sits alone in the cafeteria at lunchtime, I sit with her now. Oh. I know. I just my, oh. I cry and crying all the time oh when I open gosh. up my mail. It's it, but it's a blessing. Good for you. It's a blessing. But it's the teachers and librarians and the parents who have put these realistic books in their kids' hands. And mm -hmm. these, this is literature. Mm -hmm. This is not the beach books. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to read beach books. Go ahead. But it's literature <laughs> that will help. You know, your mind and your soul take mm -hmm. the next step. Mm -hmm. and it so, develops. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you for the book. My pleasure. It's just great. Now, I told you I love Catalyst. Yeah. Set in the same school with glimpses of. Glimpses of Melinda yes. from Speak. Yes. But um, a whole different perspective. 
And uh, my favorite line out of this one is when you have the two girls distilled to their essences, their elemental selves. Right. And I thought, what a, what a way to see it. Mm. What a way to communicate to kids, you know, about being real, mm -hmm. being true to who you are and taking all those layers off. Oh, that was fabulous. Thank you. All right, so this is Kate. This is Kate Malone, one of those super achieving everything kids <laughs> that I wasn't when I was in high school. Um, I wrote this book because I knew a lot of those super achieving kids as uh -huh. my own children went through high school. And so many of them get the message from our culture that if they just go to um, an Ivy League college and get a job and earn a lot of money, then they'll be happy and that's their job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that nothing could be further than the truth. Mm. So those kids are a little bit confused and being sold short of what real life is and, and where you should put your energy. And then you have kids at the other end of the scale, which are the kids that I hung out with in high school. Mm -hmm. And those are the Votech kids, kids who are going to work mm -hmm. with their hands. Mm -hmm. you know. And often in a high-pressured academic environment, those children get the the message that they don't count, ah, that they're not worth as much. Yes. And um, both of these messages, I think, are very harmful to our country. Mm -hmm. So I took a, a child from each social group and in, in each academic uh, track, if you will, and I throw them together in the book, mm -hmm. and sparks happen. Oh, what a fantastic contrast. Thank I mean, you. I just, ah, it's my favorite. Well, that's nice. What can I say? <laughs> All right. Now, you took those same ordinary kids. Right. You know what? I'm going to stop and ask you a question. If you were hanging out with the Votech kids, right. how'd you get to Georgetown? Oh, that's a great question. I hated school. Um, hated English class, too. Sorry. For, but I really did. I hated the way they made me analyze books. Um, I barely, you know, kind of got through. I left high school my senior year. I was an exchange student in Denmark, so that was the first place that I started to grow up. I had a bad attitude, um, largely because my family was going through difficult times, mm. and I was one of those kids who was holding in secrets, mm. not feeling like anybody else was going through this, mm -hmm. and I was pretty confused. Okay. So going overseas allowed me to do a lot of much-needed maturing, mm. and when I came back to the States, I went to the college that made me who I am today. Wow. I am a very proud graduate of Onondaga Community College oh. in Syracuse, New York. If I'd gone to a four-year school, if I'd had the money, which yes. I didn't, yes. but if I'd gone to a four-year school with the big classes, you mm -hmm. know, and the tiny teacher in the front of the room, I would have dropped out. Mm -hmm. At community college, I had professors who knew my name. Mm. And that was where my life of the mind began. I had matured. You know, I had some self-discipline. I had motivation and drive. Mm -hmm. And it turned out I was actually good at school for the first time. <laughs> It was a nice How feeling. How old were you? 19. Oh, that's great. <laughs> you know, telling me some late blooming is, yes. is still blooming. <laughs> yes. And I did so well there that Georgetown offered me a very generous scholarship. Wow. And that's how I got to Georgetown. That is a great story. Yeah. And I think that'll probably, you know, inspire a few people. All right. Back to the ordinary the kids. Or normal kids. Yes. Yes. Prom. Prom. How much fun is oh, this? Yeah. I love that book. You, you just sort of went into a whole different well, gear. <laughs> nobody dies in prom. <laughs> and and sometimes when I was telling my teen readers that, they're, they're added, the reaction was, oh, oh. couldn't you kill somebody? <laughs> couldn't you like, maim someone? Yeah, just, down, oh, uh. <laughs> but as a writer, um, you know, I, nobody likes to be pigeonholed. And one of the joys of writing for children and young adults is mm -hmm. we've got a, a wide uh, range we're allowed to play in. So uh, I wanted to, I was visiting a lot of schools again, and I saw um, kids from working class families whom I identify with. And what I see in literature so often is literature written from a middle class elitist perspective, mm -hmm. which says that if you're working class, well, then something's wrong with you. Mm. You know, oh, look at the poor, tragic people, mm -hmm. which is absurd. Yes. Um, and so I wanted to write about a working class family in which the parents, who were married to each other, mm -hmm. it still happens, mm -hmm. um, love their children. And because I'm known as a cutting edge novelist, I wanted my main character. 18-year-old uh -huh. to actually love her parents, cool. which I don't think has ever been done in That's teen fiction before. Right. 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 But I also wanted her to be facing the struggles that 18-year-olds face. You know, she's in a school, um, you know, just outside the, the, the boundary of Philadelphia. It's a diverse school. And she's a kid who's still learning how to dream big, you know, and, and how to expand her dreams to fit her potential. Mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted, I just, proms are so cool. The prom is our secular coming of age ritual. Mm -hmm. And with so many faiths in America, but prom is where we all kind of acknowledge, yeah, you're a grown up. You know, you get to put the dress on, yeah. you go in the car, you yeah. dance, hopefully you come home safely. Right. 
Um, and so I, I, I really wanted to celebrate that in the book. I love the aunts. Yes. They are so cool. Yes. I would want them for my aunts. Oh, yes. I, I had a couple of those aunts. Oh. I had, can I, if I can just get a moment here and tell yes. you about my Aunt Janet, who was, this one was so fantastic. And at a very critical point in my adolescence, she looked at me one day, um, and I was going on and on about my boyfriend, and I had a very nice boyfriend, on and on and on and on about him. And she looked at me, and her eyebrow went up, and her eyes got very cold, and she said, so, are you going to be somebody, or are you going to be somebody's girl? Ooh. And I went, ah! whoa. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you kind of remembered that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that's never that's, forgot that's it. That's a great aunt to yes, have. Yes, it is. All right, let's shift over to this. It launched as a New York Times bestseller. It did. This is Twisted. It did. And this is your book for boys. And you told me you're hearing a lot. These, well, first of all, it's a book for readers. Okay. But it's from a male perspective. Yes. Um, just because boys read the books that have female main characters and girls are reading this one. I wrote this book because of those boys who told me they were a little confused about why a girl would be depressed oh, after being raped. Okay. And that showed me that I didn't understand boys. Ah. So I spent a couple of years interviewing boys and that led to the writing of Twisted. We are now in November, and something happened. I don't know what it was, but around mid-July, I started to get emails um, from boys, usually written between 2 and 4 in the morning, huh. with no punctuation. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the emails <laughs> usually start out, dude, dude, <laughs> dude, I just finished your book. <laughs> and, and then they go on to tell me how, what, what aspect of their life is like the main characters. Often it's because they don't, ha they're, they're very sad because they don't have a good relationship with their dad mm -hmm. and they've been thinking about killing themselves. Oh, gosh. And, you know, this is so real and it's, oh. we don't like to see that as adults because right. it makes us feel helpless. Right. But they really need us yes. to see it. Yes. And it's so heartening, you know, because the, the boy is reading the book because a teacher or a librarian or an aunt mm -hmm. put it in his hands mm -hmm. and I'm hoping that mm -hmm. they'll take the next step then and talk to somebody or find mm -hmm. another book mm -hmm. and keep going. And this is about a wonderful guy that you, you love uh, named yeah. Tyler. Tyler. And, uh, I mean, when you meet him, you think, oh, gosh, all right, he's got a probation officer and right. he's gotten himself into trouble. Yeah. But he just makes such great choices along the way after that. I mean... Well, he made some bad choices. He did. I mean, everybody does. Yeah. And uh, when, when you're a boy, sometimes you make really... You know, you do things that at the time seemed like such a good idea. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And then when the police cars show up, it's like, oh, shucks, shouldn't have gone there. Um, when I, I, I named this boy Tyler Miller, Ty, because of all the knots that he's in. Ah. And Miller as kind of a nod of the head to Arthur Miller. Oh. Because his play, Death of a Death Salesman, a salesman? Mm, I think is, we will look back okay. at it as the most significant piece of American literature of wow. the last century. Okay. And I, in my mind, although it's not specific to the book, but as I was writing it, I yes. was seeing Tyler as the grandson of Willie Loman. Love it. And the third generation child of that dream, that mm -hmm. kind of artificial consumer dream. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're just, if people like you and you have money, mm -hmm. then, then you're popular and that's good. And mm -hmm. that's, that's, not a, uh, that's not a life of integrity. And it didn't work for Willie, mm -hmm. and it doesn't work for Tyler's father. Mm -hmm. And Tyler is the, the, the kid, the generation is <laughs> given a chance to change that path. I have to tell you that last night I was describing this book to my husband, mm. who's sitting there just going, all this angst. <laughs> but when I described it to him, he said, Does that, that, doesn't that just sound like death of a salesman to you? Are you kidding me? I am not kidding you. See how smart he is? He said, you know, ask her about yeah. that. So, wow, when yeah. you said that, I was like, oh, I don't believe this. Right. But anyway, well, it's, it's really fabulous, Lori. And, you know, it's another piece of all of what you've given kids through your books. Thanks. And they're just, they're just, I mean, they're great reads, but they're great tools. And as you said, windows and mirrors. Right. And I'm going to remember that. That's so great. All right. We are, this show's going to air in February, right. so it's wonderful Valentine's and everything. Happy Valentine's Day, by the way, Oh, Barbara. thank you. <laughs> thank you. And you've got a book coming out in March. In March. And let's see if they can get a close-up of this. This is Winter Girls. Winter Girls. And do you want to give us a tease on Winter Girls? If you like Speak, you'll love this one. Okay. It's dark. It's intense. 
Again, it was a book written in response to what I'm hearing from my teen readers. Um, and I hate to say, like, what it's about, you know, because yeah. it's, but it's about, it looks at a character who is trapped in the pain of eating disorders. Ah. And that's a scary world. Yeah. That's a difficult, difficult struggle. Mm -hmm. I mean, my hat goes off to any family struggling with this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to have a child who's um, into substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, everywhere you'll see messages in our culture saying you, you don't want to use drugs because they're not good for you. Right. But if you have a child who's trapped in an eating disorder, all the messages she gets from the world around her is it's good to be skinny. Stop mm -hmm. eating. Mm -hmm. That's strength. That's mm -hmm. power. And so that is a, a difficult um, it's like a casket of ice. I mm -hmm. use the whole concept of winter. Mm -hmm. There's, and this is a, if, if I've ever come close to um, a book that's not straight narrative, it's this one. I, I lean on hmm. the myth of Persephone. Oh. You know, going in the ground and there's yes. winter and yes. you'll see, kind of nervous. Oh, but, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, you've given us so much. Thank you, Barb. They're so wonderful, and we're going to look forward to that. We're going to mm -hmm. look forward to Forge and Ashes. Those are the follow-ups to change. And I understand there's a picture book coming out. Yes. And what is that I one? am writing, um, actually, two picture books. Okay. I'm writing a fun picture book <laughs> that will be out next summer um, of 2009 uh -huh. called The Hair of Zoe Fliefenbacher <laughs> Goes to School. <laughs> and it's about a little girl whose red hair would fill this room. Oh, how fun. Um, and she has to figure out how to get that that aspect of her personality oh. under control in the classroom. Brilliant, brilliant. And I'm also I've just started work on a picture book, a nonfiction picture book mm -hmm. about another one of my independent dame heroes, Ooh. and that's Abigail Adams. Oh, that'll be fabulous. Yes, so. In your hands, that's going to be well, great. Well, thanks. That's kind. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. And thank you all so much for joining us. And as always, I mean, she's got a buffet here for you. <laughs> And we hope that you're doing well in the winter time and keeping warm. And books are a great way to do that. So as always, come see us at the library. Mm -hmm.